Primary production simply is photosynthesis. But when we talk about photosynthesis on a large scale, we usually call it primary production. Um, specifically, we call it gross primary production, um, which is the total amount of CO2 that is converted um, on a monthly or an annual basis that is converted from um, CO2 uh, into uh, sugars by plants. There's also a term called net primary production, which is about 50% of the gross primary production, and that's the part that actually ends up in the tissues of the plants, because the other is the, the rest actually has to be used. Uh, it has to be used up um, by the plant in a process called respiration that returns CO2 to the atmosphere. Now, on a global scale, the numbers here are enormous. The, the basic currency in carbon cycle science is the petagram, otherwise known as the gigaton, it's the same thing, it's a billion tons. And in carbon cycle research, mostly we express quantities in terms of um, petagrams or gigatons of carbon, which of course is uh, a rather larger amount of CO2. Um, but in terms of petagrams of carbon, the total um, gross primary production each year is about 130 petagrams. So 130 billion tons of carbon each year are removed from the atmosphere um, and taken up by plants. About half of that then returns by respiration and approximately the other half um, eventually comes back to the atmosphere through the decomposition of the plant tissues and so the action of, of microbes. So that's the carbon cycle and as I said these numbers are enormous. Um, the entire atmosphere only contains about 800 and something petagrams. Fossil fuel burning, which is causing um, the CO2 and the atmosphere to increase year on year, fossil fuel burning is only uh, between 8 and 9 petagrams. So you see the actual natural exchange of carbon between the atmosphere and the biosphere is very large, um, even much larger than the amount that we are releasing um, by human activities. The difference, of course, is that the this uptake by plants is part of a cycle which has just been going on naturally, whereas fossil fuel burning is releasing CO2 from the previous products of photosynthesis um, over millions of years, uh, which are what we now know as, as fossil fuel. Of course, fossil fuel is nothing other than decomposed plants, but it took millions of years to lay it down and now we're burning it up. So. Um, so that's certainly a perturbation to the system. Primary production is obviously a very important process um, f for life and for human activities, and agricultural prim primary production is obviously fundamental for our, our survival. So it's very interesting to know how much primary production there is um, and where it is um, and how it varies with environmental factors. And one way of getting more information about primary production is by using information from space. Now, ever since the 1980s, um, there have been satellites that are recording um, the reflectivity of the land surface in different spectral bands. And because chlorophyll, the um, light-absorbing pigment that is responsible for photosynthesis, because that is green, um, clearly it's absorbing in the red, but it's not absorbing in the near infrared. And so as soon as there were satellites with instruments that were originally put up actually for, for weather forecasting pur purposes, um, but as soon as they were there, it was rapidly realized that by looking at the reflectivity in the red and in the near infrared and comparing them, you could actually get an ind index of the greenness um, and therefore the amount of chlorophyll um, on the ground. So if you know the greenness, and if you know the amount of um, incoming solar radiation um, in, the, in, the, in the bands, the visible bands that you use in photosynthesis, um, then you can calculate the amount of energy that is absorbed by green plants. So if you know that, that's one of the key, that's one of the key quantities that you need to predict photosynthesis. And there are um, products produced by um, NASA, for example, um, that give a readout um, in near real time of the amount of gross and net primary production um, by the biosphere um, and in fact um, by, by every, every kilometre, every square kilometre of the biosphere. So um, 
so that's quite detailed information. But of course, there are a few modeling steps in there. There are a few assumptions that have been made, and it turns out that um, some of the assumptions that have been made in the NASA product uh, may well be oversimplifications. So I'm taking a new approach to um, the monitoring of, of primary production from space. And to do so, I'm invoking the concept of evolutionary optimality. Using evolutionary optimality, I can predict the ratio of the CO2 concentration inside leaves to that outside, which is needed um, in order to calculate photosynthesis. But I need a couple of other quantities too, um, one of which is the so-called uh, Rubisco capacity, um, which is the basically the amount of photosynthetic enzymes that are in the leaf and therefore available to carry out photosynthesis. And the other is the so-called electron transport capacity, um, which expresses the ability of, um, quantifies the ability of um, leaves to um, translate light energy um, into chemical energy. So there are those two processes that are necessary for photosynthesis. And my argument is that they have to be balanced in terms of investment. In other words, the plant, if you like, decides um, how much it's going to invest in the two functions. And if it over invests in one, then basically it's wasting its carbon um, because then the process will be limited by the other. And this is actually quite an old idea. It's called the coordination theory. Um, but it turns out to have a lot of con consequences if you pursue it quantitatively. Um, it has a lot of con consequences that are extremely useful um, if you want to make um, predictions. Um, or indeed, if you want to um, monitor primary production from space, when you certainly haven't got measurements of, um, of these physiological quantities on every square kilometre of, of the Earth, and never will have. So we need to be able to predict those, those quantities, and this coordination theory is extremely useful because of, um, because of the quantitative um, pr predictions that, that it makes. We can actually make um, a prediction of, of both quantities. Um, we, can, we can predict the carboxylation capacity in the first instance from knowing um, some basic environmental variables, one of which is simply light. And in fact, it's proportional to light. So um, according to the light intensity, if the light intensity doubles, um, so the photosynthetic capacity that's needed to make full use of that light also doubles. Now that's really very simple. Now, it turns out that this um, theoretical approach makes a whole lot of other predictions of things that are known to be true. So the prediction is that the carboxylation capacity, Rubisco capacity as it's called, um, should increase weakly with temperature. Now, it's well known, um, you, you, can do, you can do an experiment um, in the lab where you simply increase the temperature and look at what happens to various quantities and sure enough it um, increases with with temperature um, but the effect that we predict is is not the same as that um, there's a difference between the long-term um, so-called act activated value of a biochemical quantity and the quantity that you would actually measure in a short-term experiment so we, we do predict an increase with temperature, but it's much less steep than that that you would observe in the lab. And we have been able to confirm this with field measurements by measuring the same plants um, at in the, actually in the field, so under natural conditions, um, measuring their photosynthetic rates. Um, we can confirm that the biochemical capacity for photosynthesis does indeed increase with temperature, but much less steeply. Um, than would be predicted simply by enzyme kinetics and demonstrated in a short-term experiment. Similarly, we make prediction that this quantity will increase as you go towards drier environments. Again, that's been known for a long time. Most papers give an explanation for it that we think is wrong. This is a simple evolutionary optimality argument that says this must be so um, because this is the way that the plant is making best use of resources. Similarly, we find that the um, carboxylation capacity increases with, um, with elevation. 
and that's an observation um, that people have been made for a long time and not really been able to explain. Um, we can explain it. In fact, we predict it. Uh, but perhaps most interesting is the effect of changing CO2. Given that CO2 is rising quite rapidly, there's obviously a lot of interest, a lot of scientific interest in the question of what changing the CO2 concentration does for plants. It's important because we're still in the range of CO2 concentrations that are limiting for plant growth, so there is some positive effect of increasing CO2. But a lot of other things have been observed in experiments to happen. So experiments, many experiments have been done where the concentration of CO2 um, around plants is artificially raised. One thing they find is the carboxylation capacity goes down. It's only by a few percent. Um, but it's a very consistent finding, um, and we actually predict that, and we predict the right value. And similarly, we predict the right value of change in stomatal conductance, um, which goes down. Um, the electron transport capacity is another, another story, and I'm not going to go into the complexities of, of how we infer that, but, um, but similar reasoning um, leads to a prediction of the electron transport capacity and the ratio of the electron transport capacity to the carboxylation capacity, which turns out experimentally to um, depend on the temperature at which plants are grown. Um, the ratio goes down more or less linearly um, with increasing temperature, and that is exactly what, um, what our model pr predicts. Um, so again, evolutionary optimality explains all kinds of observations that are in the literature and the thing that I have a lot of fun with is reading how people explain these phenomena um, in their papers and almost universally um, I think that they have the wrong explanation um, and that we have an alternative explanation that um, it perhaps has a more um, powerful predictive ability. So we have now a quantitative model to predict primary production and although many such models have been made, um, our model is the first to be um, based entirely on evolutionary optimality considerations. Um, and it's a great deal simpler than most of the models that are out there. But of course we wanted to test it more systematically. Now measurements of carbon dioxide um, flux into and out of ecosystems um, can be made, are being made uh, routinely at um, hundreds of stations across the world. Um, they're made with a half hourly time interval, so it's an awful, it's an awful lot of data, um, but the data can be analyzed in order to infer the gross primary production. And we've done that at um, a bunch of these sites. Um, we've looked at the monthly gross primary production in many, many different environments. Um, and we can do a good job. There's no bias at all in our prediction. There is certainly some scatter. Um, but we can do a good job, um, at least as good, in fact, slightly better um, than most of the models um, that, that are in, in the literature. So we're very pleased about that. We are looking at um, the details of the seasonal cycle, uh, when, um, when gross primary production starts, um, in, cold, in environments with a cold winter, when it starts, when it stops, um, what is its peak level, and so on. And uh, in a whole range of different ecosystems, um, we are pretty close um, to be being able to reproduce these changes. Um, in doing so, of course, we are using satellite information. We're using the satellite information on the greenness. Um, but we now have the basis then for making a monitoring product um, which we think will be um, better, um, certainly with a stronger theoretical foundation, certainly a more, um, much more extensive evaluation process um, than anything that is available at the moment. And we're going to be doing that uh, with, um, uh, with, with various collaborators in remote sensing and carbon cycle science um, to produce a um, product for the European Space Agency, um, which will be, I suppose, you could say, a rival to, um, to the long-standing products produced by NASA. <laughs>